Why is what we do first thing in the morning so important for our ability to sleep at night? Yeah. So we have this this circadian system, this sort of internal representation of a, a biological day. And what it does is anticipate the very demands of the rest activity, the sleep-wake cycle. Now, for it to be of any use, the internal day needs to be set to the real day, the astronomical day. And the classic mismatch between biological time and environmental time is jet lag. And we eventually get over jet lag as a result of exposure to the, the light-dark cycle in the new time zone. But what we require in any time zone is daily exposure to the light-dark cycle, and particularly morning light for 90% of us. Most of us have either a long body clock or a body clock that's slightly longer. And so it will naturally drift a little bit later and later and later each day. And the effects of light are not the same. Morning light advances the clock, makes, it, makes us get up earlier and go to bed earlier, whereas dusk light delays the clock. It makes us go to bed later and get up later. And so what morning light does to us is take this drifting clock and shoves it forward a bit in time so it's beautifully aligned. Now, of course, this is important at every level. I mean, we did a study a few years ago on, on teenagers and we found that, and, and all over the world, um, and found that the later the chronotype, the eveningness versus morningness, uh, the greater the evening light these young people got. So they were getting up after morning. Um, so not getting the morning light, which would advance the clock, but they were getting evening light, which would delay the clock. So part of their, their going to bed late and getting up late is when they were actually seeing light. And so morning light for most of us is really important to set the biological clock, which then aligns all of our activity, including the sleep-wake cycle, to the appropriate time of day. Yeah, so this is fascinating. There's so much there. So we live according to 24-hour days. Yeah. Okay. But one thing I'm aware of from your book and other research is that our internal clocks are not set to exactly 24 hours. So exactly. I want to I talk about that and why you think that might be, because we certainly, I guess, didn't evolve for plane travel in the future. Oh, you know, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so when we go on a 12-hour flight to LA from London, yeah. we could adapt straight away, right? So that presumably wasn't evolution's goal. So I'm interested as to why it's not 24 hours in mm. your view, but also you say morning light. So does it matter what time of morning light that is, you know, can people get it at lunchtime? Are we talking as soon as people wake up? And of course that changes in the seasons, yes. right? So can you help us put okay. all those things together? Okay, so why isn't the human body clock exactly 24 hours? Well, now here's some hand waving because the, the modelers say that if you want two oscillators to align to each other, two rhythms, one is fixed, obviously the, the rotation of the earth is fractionally under 24 hours. And if you want to fit a, a body clock to that, it helps if it's slightly different from 24 hours, because then it can a, a align more easily. Now, I don't pretend to understand the mathematics <laughs> behind it, but that's why, why it is. But there's, a, there's an easy... So Mother Nature knew what she was doing. She, of course, what you're as always. <laughs> um, but the really interesting question, I think, for me is, why is there such diversity in the human chronotype. So, the, you know, the fact that we have some people, you know, are really early larks and some people really late owls. There's a huge diversity, you know, to the extent that you could almost bed share in some extremes. Whereas if you look at the mice or any other animal you want to study, it's all very, very similar. And I think this is something that, that's puzzled me for ages. And it may well be that in our society, you know, and we've, we've only moved very rapidly from sort of essentially small groups, tribes, interacting, <clears throat> it may have been useful under those circumstances to have vigilance across the 24-hour mm. day and having some people that were sort of awake early um, and could perhaps alert the group that there was danger from another tribe, for example, or, or, or some sort of animal. And that may be why we've retained this extraordinary diversity. It's very, yeah. We're very weird as a species in that regard. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You mentioned the word chronotype. Yeah. I wonder if you could just elaborate exactly what does chronotype mean? And then you also mentioned owls and larks. And I'm really interested in this because 
A, me and my wife appear to have slightly different body clocks. But many people I feel, certainly if I look at my clinical experience, Russell, and this also I think speaks to this idea that the body clock isn't quite 24 hours, that we can manipulate it depending on what we need it to do or what the tribe needs or what the weather is, right? A lot of the time I think, well, are we evening types really evening types or are they evening types because of the modern light environment yes um so yeah quite a lot there <laughs> yeah yeah okay so, so what defines your chronotype whether you're a morning person or an evening person and there are a number of factors the first of all is one's genetics we now know that the clock genes and the proteins that they make subtle changes subtle polymorphisms in those genes are associated with morningness and eveningness so by their contribution to our genes our parents are still telling us what time to get up and go to bed <laughs> at, at some level so that's the first thing through development our chronotype changes so from about the age of 10 we want to start to go to bed a bit later and a bit later our lateness peaks in males at around about 21 21 and a half in in females about 19, 19 and a half, and males peak later, uh, or they have a later chronotype than females. Then from those late teens, early 20s, we start to move to a more morning chronotype. So by the time we're in our late 50s, early 60s, we're getting up and going to bed on average when we got up and went to bed when we were 10. And that sort of basically maps the changes in some of the sex steroids, testosterone and estrogen. So it's thought that there's a, a very important hormonal mod modification of, 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 of the clock. So that's within individuals. We've that's all got like, individuals. so whatever I'm born with, let's say I was born a morning type, and I think I'm a morning type. Then when I'm 10, in my teenage years, that's going to be pushed. It's going to be later and later. Yeah. As you say, for most males, a peak at 21 and then it's going to start going back again. But what about between individuals? There's variation huge, there as well, right? In, yeah, uh, a huge in individual variation. I think that's a really important point because, you know, in terms of our sleep-wake patterns, among our chronotype, there's massive individual variation. And, and you know, um, <clears throat> it, there's a, on average about a two-hour difference from somebody in their, from the, in their late 50s, early, uh, uh, early 60s, uh, to somebody in their late teens. So asking a, a teenager to get up at seven o'clock in the morning is like asking a, a 60 year old to get up at five o'clock in the morning. Now, does that matter? I guess there's a real interest here for me, given that my son's 12 and about to enter uh, these teenage years. Yes. And as a family, we prioritize sleep, or we certainly have done, but I'm, I'm already noticing with him a change yep. in terms of his desire to do what he has done in the past. Let's put it like that. Okay. Yeah, test, I think they call it testosterone poisoning, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> and what I'm interested in is when we say teenagers want to go to bed later and wake up later and we think about their chronotype, what if that teenager still went to bed early? So mm. what's driving the change? Is it the fact that they're going to bed late, therefore they're having to stay in bed later? Like, could that be environmental, school pressure, that sort of stuff? Or do, yeah. do you know what I'm getting yeah, at? Absolutely. Well, well, of course, the, the other factor, the sort of, as it were, the, the, the biological factor would be when you see light. As we, as we d just discussed, sort of morning light advances the clock, evening light delays the clock. And teenagers, particularly over the weekend, will miss the morning light making them get up earlier, but they'll get the evening light, so they're, or the afternoon evening light, and so they'll go to bed later. So those are the three sort of biological uh, factors. But then we have to add a couple of other things. One is, of course, the use of social media. Uh, it's very interesting. Many te teenagers appreciate that they shouldn't be using social media into the early hours of the morning, uh, but they feel uh, that sense of being connected to their group over overrides that knowledge about why it's important to be asleep. So there's that element. And in fact, it's really fascinating. Some studies have shown that that lateness can be hugely late. So what happens, of course, is that they have very shortened sleep. Mm. They're driven out of bed by an alarm clock or a parent. They struggle through the school day. Often, and when you, te you know, talk to many teachers, the kids are actually falling asleep at the desks. So then they finish school and then they have not just a short nap, but it can be a nap of two hours or so, mm. which then pushes back the pressure to sleep 
that night. And so, so you know, the, the, the desire to use social media and the fact that they're not as tired because they had to sleep in the late afternoon means that they can function later um, uh, at night and they get that shortened sleep. And in fact, you have to be very careful because it can lead to increasingly shortened sleep at night and longer naps after school, which, you know, and you can fall into this sort of feedback loop of really disrupting the sleep. If that teenager could go to sleep, let's say, on time, at a more suitable time, given what time they have to get up for school or the school yeah. bus or whatever, the, the yeah. sort of fixing that they can't move. Does the later chronotype still matter, i.e. if they shift their environment? So actually, I'm still going to, I'm going to go to bed earlier. I'm not going to expose myself to evening light, uh, this may sound <laughs> optimal and hypothetical <laughs> or something that's practically impossible, but yeah. in theory, would that then normalize things, do you think? Yeah, you can shift teenagers to an earlier chronotype because of light exposure, absolutely. Uh, it, practically, it's, it's, it's very difficult, um, but it's, it, it's in theory yeah. possible, yeah. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. Everybody has to learn how to do this. Your whole life gets better. Learning to control your nervous system will change everything. The foundational practice that I truly believe every person should do every day is